Hey guys and girls, how are you going? Just been talking to you recently about lighting, anything from uh, light tripods and monopods and camera bags. But today I'd just like to put to you the bigger tripod and the larger camera unit I use for most of my video use. I'll just run you through all the details because there's some interesting uh, paraphernalia on it that I think is quite interesting to have a look at. So bear with me as I go grab my rig and I'll just walk you through it. Here we have it here. It's actually the DA10 in the centre there and amongst it we have a aperture monitor, a Fodka follow focus unit and then a big mat box. And the reason I have all these accessories is just simply to aid me in the general use of videoing. Underneath here is a large rail system as you can see. And the idea of the rail system is to mount all those accessories in a way that's safe and practical but also not to interfere with the camera movement. So it gives it a great rigidity. How do you mount it? Well, it's very simple. It just slides on to the rig here. Here it go. Click. You know, it's safe. Always make sure you lock it on. I've, I've mentioned this many times, but, you know, can you imagine uh, tilting your camera down and that whole rig just fell to the floor? I think you'd be heartbroken. I know I would be. But definitely make sure it's secured well. And I'll just run you through here all the different features and why I have these accessories in the first place, because, you know, there are many documentaries uh, on YouTube explaining how they work, but not many of them explain why they have them. So what I was just going to show you first, we'll start with the uh, monitor at the back. The monitor here is attached to a ball head. The ball head is not particularly expensive, it's a $30 ball head, but it's suitable of course for a lightweight monitor. And it just gives me the flexibility now, of, I've got a giant flippy screen in effect. It's 7 inches across in diameter, in contrast to the little 3 inch screen on the actual camera, and that just makes viewing so much more pleasurable and interesting and easy to see. So yeah, I can move this in any angle that I should wish, and having that flippy screen that's so large is a, a real asset, especially when you're trying to gain focus or get composition. So uh, how does it all operate? Well, it's simply it plugs in, as you can see, through HDMI directly into the camera, so it's instantaneous. Uh, transfer of image. Uh, you've obviously got some buttons and options here. It does have things like uh, zebra striping, uh, you know, all sorts of focus aiding and uh, exposure mode compensation. But my biggest uh, you know, interest in this monitor is simply the larger screen size so I can see what I'm doing. Now I'm not getting any younger, my eyes are getting a bit deteriorating over time. And when it comes to the fine detail, I need all the help I can get. So rather than rely on that little monitor and putting my glasses on and struggling to see what's going on, the bigger monitor just makes the whole experience more enjoyable and comfortable. In fact, I don't even need my glasses, so large is the monitor. Let me illustrate for you exactly how that looks. I'll just tilt it around for you. I, I trust you'll be able to see everything okay there. And if I use this little follow focus unit, you should be able to see me there, go out of focus and come into focus quite easy. And then that's a nice sharp image and I'm very comfortable with it. So that's how it works and the flippy screen sort of idea is brilliant. I mean you can get a camera already has a flippy screen, a lot of video cameras of course have flippy screens, but the thing is you're still stuck with that tiny little three inch monitor and you're struggling to see what's going on. So anything you can buy that makes your job just a little bit easier, I think it's a great investment and you should do it. The uh, second uh, thing I'm going to draw your attention to now is here we've got the follow focus unit. Follow focus is really just a geared wheel that's firmly mounted to this rail system so it doesn't jiggle or mess around with your footage. So rather than just using the lens to focus with, which of course you can do that, but you can imagine with video and you're talking the camera trying to get the focus, you can make a complete shambles of your shot. So this way being all rigidly connected together and geared, it's a very smooth and fluid motion without disturbing the video footage in any way. The other advantage of the follow focus is you have these little locking tools on it where you can set focus points. You might be able to see that, go click here at the top, all the way down and fix there. So what this means is if you've got two images and you want to focus from one to the other repeatedly, you can set those focus points and you know every time you turn this direction for example, the one closest to you will absolutely be in focus because you've preset that and then when you go to the second focal point you know that the next person or the next object is in focus. So you can shift from one to another quite quickly and easy and you know that it's always in focus because it's already preset. So that's really a, a great little option you've got. Uh, the next stage from there is this large mat box on the front. Now it's a huge apparatus and people might think well what's the point of that anyway? I mean when you, every time you buy a lens you get you know, a cover for it, these lens hoods, and they block out all the stray light, don't they? Well, yes, actually, they're really good, and they do a great job, and, of course, they come with the uh, lens, so why not use them? But uh, on this application here, there are two reasons why I have uh, the 
matte box and it's not only to block out all the stray light because you've got fully adjustability and it's excellent if you're in a studio environment you've got some very harsh strobes or strong lights coming down and you really need to block that uh, you've got plenty of option to do that but the other thing I really like about it uh, is this item here at the top which is these filter trays now you know why a filter tray why not just buy a screw-in filter for your lens well it's not that there's anything wrong with the screw-in filters they're fine but the problem is, is when you've got 10 lenses. You know, if you've got all sorts of zooms and prime lenses and you're swapping from one to another, you don't want to have to own 10 different filters for 10 different lenses because they all come in different sizes. You know, one's 77 mil, one's 67 mil, one's 52. You know, how many of these things you got to buy? This system here is brilliant because by purchasing this one $200 item and therefore another a good glass lens here this one this filter here cost me about $150 it's a Benro filter and a quality glass one optical glass and that means by slotting that in uh, I only need to buy one item for every lens I own so it slots in quite easily there and then filter is covering and I don't have to buy 10 different lenses uh, sorry 10 different uh, filters so you can imagine the saving of money there a couple of hundred dollars for that item there versus a couple of hundred dollars per lens is multiplied by 10 that would be thousands of dollars so it's actually a saving to make that little purchase so for two hundred dollars I'm actually saving maybe a thousand dollars or more so that's really why I have it it's a professional piece of equipment it looks good but it's not about pose factor it actually has a very very practical function it also has the function of having two filters which means I have one here as you may be able to see I just spin this around in case you can't it has a, uh, a filter also on it as well which moves around and that gives you the option of using uh, various density filters that are uh, filtered maybe it's strong on the top pale on the bottom you can tilt that if you need to block some light from this side perhaps uh, also for polarizing filters can be very useful for this as well so you know you've got two filters you can double up you know saves you buying maybe you know a two stop filter or a four stop filter and a six or an eight what you can do is you can buy a two and a four and you can have the various combinations of that making up various different densities of filter so that's a terrific saving as well so some things you think oh it's all pose factor or it's uh, perhaps waste of money but no it actually can be saving you a lot of money in the long run so that's why I have these apparatus here what I'm also would like to show you now though is this ball head the ball head is very interesting it's quite an obscure shape you might look at that and think oh I've never seen one quite like that before and that's because this is a very specific one not only is it a video ball head and gives a beautiful, glorious, smooth, fluid movement, uh, you know, if I want to go up or down on this thing here, it is extremely smooth and very, very nice and soft. So that's excellent. You need that for video as you're moving around. But the other thing it has is this little button here, which enables you to go from what it is now, which is the movie mode, you flick the button down, and then you can go to photo mode. So how does that operate? Well, I'll just illustrate this as I soften it off. And now, as you can see, I can come down. If I restrict that movement a bit, it just makes the whole thing a little bit softer as I come down. And there you go. And we can have a beautiful portrait shot, you can see from the screen there. So now we can get a portrait shot, do some photography there, and uh, that'll be a great asset because now I don't have to have two different ball heads. I buy one ball head, say, for $250, and that saves me have to carry around two ball heads at $200 a pop. It's saving me money. Plus, it's versatile because now I only have to carry around one item with me and I know it's going to do either. So that's very handy. And it supports the weight of this rig. And let me tell you, this is not a light rig. All in all, I think we're looking at about 8 kilos of gear here together. And that ball head more than compensates for it, just depending on the adjustments you have. But uh, I found it quite uh, an amazing design. So I couldn't help myself but get it. So sometimes you buy a little, you pay a little bit of extra money, maybe it was a little bit dearer than most, but the fact that I've got two things in one, well that's ultimately saving me money, isn't it? So what about the tripod? Well I've shown you the ball head, I've shown you the actual configuration of my gear, but this tripod is a Vanguard tripod, and it's uh, oh, weigh about four kilos, so it's about three times heavier and stronger than the other one I showed you, the light tripod. And even though that one works fine, I'm actually shooting on, on with it now, I'm using the D7100 camera with a 35mm prime lens and that uh, tripod is doing a perfect job if you're in a fixed position but if I'm sort of moving things around and coming up and down you know uh, I'm going to want something that's incredibly stable so the whole thing isn't jiggling around unnecessary and moving 
and uh, this uh, tripod does an excellent job. It's not about the brand, but it's just about the fact that it's robust. It's a good, heavy, strong one, and that's suitable for the heavy, strong system I have up here. So I'm very much about buying balanced rigs. Don't try and cut corners and think, oh, I can save a couple of dollars by buying a lighter tripod. But, you know, when you start to actually start coming to use it, everything's shaking around and wobbling because it's, it's flexible. You need something very rigid and firm, and that's what this one does. So I'm very happy with the combination, and uh, I just thought I'd run you through it so you understand what all this paraphernalia is and what it does. Again, you also might have noticed that it's quite a windy day. It's a little bit on the gloomy side, but that's not the worst of it. The worst of it is really the wind, and uh, that's why I have this little ME1 microphone. You might be able to just pick it up there and see it. Uh, it's an excellent little unit. has the uh, windsock on it. It looks like a dead cat. That's in fact what they call them. I got it from Germany and it's a terrific little purchase. Just saves all the nasty wind noise because I can tell you I take a lot of video and I can't, I can't even begin to describe how many videos have ended up ruined in the past because of wind noise. Get a good gust going over your microphone, particularly if it's the one mounted on the camera, and you just get that and it just destroys your sound and it's very difficult to remove that or change the situation. So I recommend you purchase the right gear for the right stuff certainly use it in the right conditions. I mean, it's a $30 item, that little dead cat thing they put on top of the microphone, but if it's going to save your video for the day, well worth it, a great investment. The video, of course, is uh, worked by the fact that I have a 5 meter extension cable going to the microphone. That enables me to put it pretty much anywhere I like. I have a spare 3 meter cable extension as well, but I don't always recommend cables. I think if you've got people moving around, you're going to want the little lapel style microphones. But for this sort of an arrangement, it's a more than satisfactory situation. Another thing I like to talk to you about when it comes to uh, video, and this is it, look, a very personal choice. I'm not saying it's a law or a rule of camera work, but I have found that prime lenses on video do seem to work much better. Uh, you can buy some very high quality zooms, buy a you know, Nikon 70 to 200 or something like that, and you'll get some great results. But really, I've just found that any sort of a prime lens tends to give you a much clearer, crisper picture. So I'd highly recommend you invest in some prime lenses, get some decent quality ones, and you won't be disappointed. Which lenses would I recommend for video? Well, you know, you want the general four, I would recommend. Uh, you'd use them for your photos anyway, so there's no loss in value in buying them. Uh, generally, I use the 35, I use a 50mm, an 85, and then I have 180mm. So that covers all the focal ranges that I require. Anything in between that, you just move the camera a little bit further back or further closer, and that uh, compensates for that. But prime lenses do tend to give a much cleaner shot, I feel, and I'm really happy with the results of them, for focusing particularly. I'm just going to run you through the uh, tripod that I was showing you earlier. Just wanted to point out here, you can see it's an Actus uh, 323AT. And the reason I have this tripod particularly is its robustness. It's actually about three times heavier than the other light tripod I was showing you. It's purposely built for being very robust and durable. It's weighty. It weighs about four kilos. But as you can see, it's quite strong and able to take the heavy rig that I put on it. So what are some of the features that I like particularly about this one? Well, the first thing I do like about it is it has a numerical system on the feet. Can you pick that up in the camera? I hope you can. And uh, they're all numbered. So what happens here is that when you're adjusting the legs, you can actually go to level 2, 3, 4, and you know that all around it, as long as you have it all set on the same number, it's all going to be perfectly stable and, and flat. So that helps with gaining your horizontal. The other thing I like is these twist locks. Now, the clip lock's okay, they work fine, but these things I just find that when you twist them on tight, they just seem to be that little bit more robust. And uh, it gives me a confidence that it's not going to slip. I mean, you can appreciate when you put a rig of this sort of weight, weighs about three or four kilos on top, the last thing you want is the thing to be slipping down. So you lose your horizontal. <clears throat> so uh, again, it's got twist locks everywhere to uh, assure that everything's firm and steady. Obviously, I've taken the camera off because it's too tall. You wouldn't see the camera on top of that anyway. But I've got it up high so I can illustrate the features. Particularly a feature I did want to illustrate to you is this little uh, rotating little hook. You might think, well, what, what's that hook all about? Why would you need that? Well, it's really all about uh, a counterbalance. You see, if you've got the camera up high, I mean, the ball head weighs enough, you've got another three or four kilos of camera gear up there, video or otherwise, uh, you've got it very top heavy. And as you're talking and twisting the camera to get the various shots, what you can do is you can sort of tip it and make a lot of movement because it's all the weights up high. So how can you counterbalance it? We're just using something as simple as I have to illustrate here, a little camera bag. You fill that camera bag full of 
uh, you could be your lenses, uh, all sorts of weights or whatever you want to use, it doesn't matter what it is you're using, but the point is that you've got something down there to counterbalance the weight up top. Some people use gym weights or sandbags, that's all great. So remember, you've got to carry that with you everywhere you go, so be uh, careful how much weight you put in it. But really, it's just a counterbalance. So if you've got four kilos up top, why not have four kilos down here, and the whole rig is now balanced beautifully, and when you're manoeuvring it around with a handle, you're not twisting or tilting the whole unit. Because, you know, that's a lot of weight, and it's not hard to topple that over a bit. I should point out one other thing, if I may. You notice the feet on it. Big padded feet, all round. And what's the point of those? soft surface. If you're happy to be on a sandy or gravelly surface, you know, you want all this grip you can get. Particularly, a uh, concern is some of the feet are actually quite pointy. Even though they have a rubber stopper on the end of a light tripod's foot, it's still a thin item. And if you're on sand or soft soil, that can slowly creep in and dig. And then your beautiful horizon that you'd set all of a sudden starts to creep out of line. And if you're not noticing that that's happening, you can ruin your shops. So those big uh, padded feet, give you that stability, it doesn't punch into the soil and uh, gives you that stability you want, confidence that you're always going to retain your horizontal level.